welcome to our weekly look inside Syria. I'm Veronica Pedroza. After more than two years of fighting the forces of President Bashar al-Assad in Syria, opposition fighters are turning their guns on each other. The infightings led the Free Syrian Army to reiterate their demand for more weapons from the international community. They want to drive out what they say are al-Qaeda-linked opposition fighters. This intensified rivalry among opposition groups comes after an FSA commander was shot dead in Latakia province in North Syria. Meanwhile, on Tuesday, fighters from the Pakistani Taliban, or TTP, announced they'll set up a command and control center in Syria. A spokesman for the group says the first contingent's ready to start operating alongside opposition rebels, and as many as 150 more are on their way to fight against Syrian government forces. So, the Free Syrian Army is now fighting other rebels linked to al-Qaeda for territory and control. Zaina Khoda has this report. Members of the al-Qaeda-linked group came from Arab countries to support the fight against the Syrian regime. Now they are no longer just on the front lines. They are strengthening control over villages close to the Turkish border. It is seen by some as an effort to cement power, but the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant says it's cleansing the area from regime supporters and those who are fighting Islam. They also want to create an Islamic State. Not all in the Syrian opposition share that goal. And it is men like these the West doesn't want to arm, and it has urged the Free Syrian Army to retake areas under their control. But the FSA command says they have received death threats from the Islamic State in Iraq, and they appear unsure on how to handle the tensions. The FSA has not declared war on al-Qaeda-linked groups, at least not yet, even though they have already lost men and territory to the Islamic State. Divisions are growing among opposition forces. Syria's Kurds now seem to be on the offensive in the northeast corner of the country. The main Syrian armed Kurdish group, the PYD, said they would no longer accept any force to impose their will and share power in Kurdish populated regions as they plan to set up their own administration. Divisions among the various groups fighting the Assad government have become open confrontations for power, territory and ideology. These wars within wars in northern Syria could only weaken the fight against the regime. Zena Khudr for Inside Syria. So to discuss the deepening rift among Syrian rebels and how the Free Syrian Army may soon be fighting an al-Qaeda-linked faction and President Assad's forces, we're joined by our guests. In Washington, D.C., Luai al-Muqdad, the political and media coordinator for the Free Syrian Army. In Beirut, Professor Yezid Sayeg, a senior associate at Carnegie Middle East Center, and in London, Haitham Sabahi, Syrian political activist. Welcome to you all, gentlemen, and thank you. I want to start by uh, talking to Professor Yezid Sayag in Beirut, because you've written recently about the strategic balance in the battlefield. And I want to ask you if the situation has changed dramatically since the fall of Qusair to Assad forces, uh, with the introduction of these new al-Qaeda-linked groups coming in? Well, we seem to be heading into a new stalemate in Syria in which the regime forces still have superiority, not only in terms of firepower, but in terms of organization, cohesion, um, adaptation, their ability to learn lessons. But they've also been running out of steam because as they've tried to take on harder targets on several fronts, their manpower problems are starting to tell, so that their risk really is of overextending. Equally, the opposition uh, has not yet resolved some key problems of fragmentation, lack of real command and control over battlefield units, battlefield management, integration, coordination between all these different factions of, uh, you know, Islamist, non-Islamist type. And so they've been able to slow down the regime, and I think that possibly with some of the new weapons that are starting to come in, they can uh, sort of fight the regime to a standstill. But this stalemate is, is, I think, unstable because the regime may continue in coming months to see where it's got opportunities and it's better able to seize those opportunities and go in and take bits of territory. Uh, I think we're settling in for a, a sort of a longer hole here in which economic factors may become the more important 
game changer on both sides rather than the entry of, say, jihadist groups of, of Al-Qaeda. They're a factor, but I don't think they are the critical factor. Well, that's an interesting point. But I want to um, take up now um, with Luai uh, Muqtadi in uh, Washington, D.C., whether he feels that we're at a turning point with the beheading of a Free Syrian Army commander um, in Syria recently, and whether he thinks we are looking now at an anti-Al-Qaeda rebellion within a rebellion. Yeah, actually we have been warned and uh, mentioned many times two years ago that not supporting the Free Syrian Army with the, with the weapons that it needs and by uh, the international community that how much we need the proper we weapon and the organization and to help us to get the Bashar al-Assad regime out of Syria and to build our uh, democratic country, that it will make these uh, groups on the ground it make it more strong. And, and that's what happened, actually. Now, today, they are stronger. They are uh, more effective on the ground because they have their own uh, network, money networks, their own sources for money, for weapons. And now they are, as you see last week, after they killed uh, uh, Kamal Hamami, the leader in the Superior Military Council, they announced a war, an open war against us and against the civilian in Syria. Because the, from the start, so we warned that we told, we told all the in Washington, D.C., from the Friends of Syria. What will those arms be used for? For fighting the Assad regime? or for fighting Al-Qaeda-linked groups. Um Actually, in Washington, D.C., we are not asking for arms. We are preparing for the vis visits for the General Salim Idris, the chief staff, and, uh, uh, and uh, for the President Ahmed Jarba, the president of the coalition. What we're asking from all the country, the Europe and the uh, 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 American uh, government, and all everyone who cares about the future of Syria, that they should move and they should help us. They should uh, help the Syrian people. They should help them by, at least they should cut the sources from Bashar al-Assad of the Bashar al-Assad regime. He has this open sources with the Iranian, with the Russian. He's bringing the militia. He's bringing Hezbollah. He's bringing the extremist group. How you can explain to me that Dawlat uh, al-Iraq uh, was sham, this extreme group Let me, let me put this question to, to you in another way. Is it unavoidable now that there is a rebellion within a rebellion? Do you think that Syrian, uh, free Syrian army fighters are going to ignore the opportunity to fight al-Qaeda-linked groups? They're taking the fight uh, our, to you. Our main, well, yeah, our, our main war is with the regime and to, and to save our civilian people and to build our democratic country who based on liberty and democratic because the majority of the Syrian people, they are Muslims, but they are moderate. moderate. They are not extremists. If Al-Qaeda groups and especially Jabhat al-Nusra and Dawlat al-Iraq al-Sham, they will fight us, we have to fight them back. We, can, we have no choice. We don't want to make any side wars now. We want to do the, our war only with the regime and to save the civilian inside Syria. But if they want to fight us, we have to fight back and we have to save our cities and our liberated area from those extremist groups because they had their hidden agenda. They want to announce their Islamic country and this is against the Syrian people will. I wonder, Haitham Sabahi, uh, if you uh, think that there is indeed a changing in the course of the battle at the moment, of the war at the moment, and how far could the Syrian regime actually benefit from it? When uh, Luai is talking about a hidden agenda, um, the regime has been accused of actually allowing these groups to come into the country. Well, let me tell you, first of all, I mean, uh, Syria as a state uh, made out of a regime, army and people has no choice only to fight these people on the ground. As, as we see now, the Syrian army is an advancing in a different area. I wonder, I wonder what the Free Syrian Army or the representative of Free Syrian Army doing in Washington. Now they are betraying the people who, from Jabhat al-Nusra and from Al-Qaeda, who's Mu'ad al-Khatib one day in Morocco, called them friends and associates. They, the, the Free Syrian Army, who allowed these people and brought them in to take controls of the 
area and they are in control and the Free Syrian Army cannot fight them and now they're heading to Washington to betray what they call them brothers one day and uh, of course after uh, Britain and France giving up on them uh, the Americans they know very well uh, and they found out as uh, the, S uh, the, the Americans found out the SNC and the Free Syrian Army's beneficiaries they are not worth to trust I mean this, this is, is the situation at the moment and the Americans have all say, an old say if you lie down with, with dogs you get up with the fleas so they don't want anything to do anything so if they are in Washington now to beg the Americans they are on the wrong foot there is the only way for the Free Syrian Army or so called the Free Syrian Army is to fight those Islamists uh, Al Qaeda on the ground of Syria maybe they put their hands together with the Syrian Army because the Syrian army and the Syrian government working for the Syrian people, working for the ground, mm. and before they, they miss the train, uh, the, I mean, the Syrian army will advance, will take areas, and Hi, there is, uh, Hi, because Zabani, there is no other choice for a minute, Because I just want to clarify something for our viewers, because we, we make it sound that there are distinct, as if there are these distinct groups, but the reality um, in on the ground in Syria is extremely complex. Uh, just to remind viewers, there are several hard line Islamic opposition groups fighting in Syria, the most prominent are the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. The group was established as an umbrella organization of Iraqi insurgent groups in October of 2006 under the name of Islamic State of Iraq. The group's been responsible for the deaths of thousands of Iraqi civilians as well as members of the Iraqi government and its international allies. By late 2012, the group was said to have renewed its strength and more than doubled its number of members to about 2,500. And in April of 2013, the group changed its name to the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant and became deeply involved in the Syrian civil war. Another hardline jihadist opposition group fighting in Syria is the Nusra Front. In April, the head of al-Nusra Front in Syria pledged its allegiance to al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri. Al-Nusra was established in January of 2012 and since then has used car bombs and suicide attacks in its efforts to bring down the Assad government. It has around 6,000 members and is believed to be largely funded and trained by Al-Qaeda in Iraq. In December, the US State Department put Al-Nusra on its list of terrorist organizations. It said it was responsible for hundreds of attacks and the deaths of countless civilians. Professor Sayeg in Beirut, um, I've seen several attempts to um, graphicize, as it were, what the battlefield is like. There are thousands and thousands of fighters in groups as small as maybe 10 men. Um, how can you say that the economic issues may in the end outweigh this incredible kind of com complex, chaotic situation on the ground? Well, what I mean by that is that as the conflict pro you know, becomes more prolonged and as the two sides more or less balance each other out, although they have very different capabilities, but for various reasons, neither side is able to achieve a military victory. Um, what this means is that in the meantime, these, all these groups, on the one side, the rebel groups and the government, have to deal with economic issues. They have to raise revenue. They have to find means of financing themselves. They also have to provide local administration, ensure food supply, uh, fuel, medical services. And regardless of who exactly is providing this, this is an overwhelming need. And the longer this takes, then of course, the more prominent this need becomes. And already we see a war economy emerging on the ground in which according to reliable reports, Jabhat al-Nusra sells oil, it exports oil, uh, in agreement with the government in which it returns a certain share of, of, the, of the sales to the government. There's other areas where the government grinds wheat to turn it into flour for people, farmers living in rebel-held areas. This is a natural development in most wars of this type that, that become protracted. And, and what I think is that um, whether it's Kurdish militias in the north that are now uh, preparing to uh, uh, vote or elect a, a local administration, whether it's is the Islamist groups in Raqqa city, whoever it is in all these different areas and in government areas, you see local actors, even local warlords on both sides actually, militias which develop their own local economy because they need to survive, because they need to provide. Um, I think this is going to become an increasingly important factor. It may lead to 
implicit alignments or alliances and exchanges and cooperation even across the battle lines on both sides. <laughs> It, uh, the, the question of public finances. I mean, the pressure on the Syrian lira is massive. How long can the government go on providing subsidized food commodities to reduce prices while at the same time propping up the Syrian pound? These are all immensely big issues that I think will become more important in the next six to nine months. Hey, you could look at the situation then as um, at the same time as seeming to be a quagmire on the battlefield, also an opportunity for more political dialogue. I want to know what you think, Haitham Sabahi, in London, um, whether you think that this could be an opportunity now. An, an opportunity for, for dialogue for what? with sorry. the opposition to go to Geneva. Well, well, uh, Sy Syrian government is always he wa always was ready for dialogue. When, uh, especially when it happened Geneva one, when they were preparing for Geneva two, and is called for a dialogue between Syrians under Syrian sovereignty from the beginning. Then they they never waved away from it. They always called these groups, and if they want a dialogue for a future Syria, they are ready. But some of these groups, like the SNC and the Free Syrian Army, the Free Syrian Army. Me, they align themselves with other countries, with the Western countries to say, and with Saudi Arabia and Qatar. And they didn't understand. They are naive and ill-informed. When they dealt with the Western politicians, they don't understand when a Western politician, when he says yes, he means maybe. And when he says maybe, he means no. And he never say no. So they thought these Western countries could help them right at the end by uh, calling for no-fly zones, uh, safe areas. Uh, entered the war they didn't read the map properly so the the most of them i'm talking about the syrians here they have no choice only to sit with the government of syria with the syrian people as a dialogue on a conference to solve these issues if the snc and the free syrian army keep running to this country as, as G general Idris said britain betrayed us britain didn't betray them britain has an interest if he he uh, uh, give that interest to, to Britain, Britain will help him. If there is uh, nothing he can do, uh, Britain just will throw him away. Lawyer this is what's I'm sure you want to respond to this. There is no, po there is, let me finish this. There is no democracy in diplomacy and there is no humanity in diplomacy. There is an interest and an interest only. Actually, I like it when Mr. Haysam from London, he talk about the humanity and he talk about the democracy. Let me explain something for the people about the humanity. I didn't talk about or. democracy and Bashar, humanity. Bashar al-Assad, you are talking about humanity, please, Mr. Haysam. I left you to, to continue all your... Bashar no, al-Assad, he killed more 100... 100. This is what okay. I explained. Okay, 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 okay. Bashar al-Assad regime, the person who you said that they are ready for dialogue with the opposition and with the Syrian people, he killed, he killed more than 150,000 persons he used cod missiles he used he used uh, 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 the missiles the tanks the aircraft against his own people so if he can say no Bashar al-Assad he didn't use the ballistic uh, uh, missiles okay we can we can talk about something else he used the missiles with unconventional warheads and it was being documented by more than 15 countries that Bashar al-Assad he crossed the chemical red lines and he's killing the Syrian people by the chemical red line uh, chemical weapons another thing is that he's saying because we can't fight Al-Qaeda and Bashar al-Assad he's fighting against Al-Qaeda. That's a big lie because Bashar al-Assad he's the person and he's the one who opened the border for the Hezbollah militia who's also extremist militia. Not only Al-Qaeda extremist, Hezbollah is extremist and he brought the Shia extremist militia also from Iraq who's Liwa Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and these names who, uh, they are working in Syria and they are killing the Syrian people. I don't know if he can say no about that. And again and again, if you want to take about, talk about Jabhat al-Nusra, it has been founded on 2006 right in Iraq, by under, but under under um, the sponsor for Jabhat al-Nusra and for Dawlat al-Iraq Washam, it was the Bashar al-Assad regime who he founded this uh, uh, organization inside al-Iraq to fight you against the Americans the there. For them with to come in. You I, I don't know. Ask, ask you. Uh, okay, okay, is, okay, okay. Let me, let me, let me show you how we we give them the way. Now Bashar al-Assad is fighting us in more than 450 points. Okay, all these points we are fighting only the Free Syrian Army and the regime, and he don't touch. The, 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 the cities or the basement for Al-Qaeda no, no, and no, Jabhat al-Nusra. Look the at truth. them in Raqqa and there is Zor, Mr. Haysam. 
Look, look, look at Raqqa at the resort, and you know what I'm talking about. He left the you oil and the their hands, Raqqa. and he didn't. Outside of Sorry? Syria, there is a big debate going on amongst the international community and within the so-called Friends of Syria about how to arm, who to arm, what kind of arms will go into the country and, uh, and who, who's going to take advantage of them. But I want to ask you, Yezid Sayag, whether you think that the kind of strategy, if it can be called that, from the Friends of Syria, uh, that they are, seem to be considering will make a difference? I, I don't think the Friends of Syria um, are able or actually committed to um, arming the opposition in a significant way. They may eventually, and I, by this I mean the US and the UK and France in particular, they may eventually uh, provide a more significant supply of advanced anti-tank and maybe anti-aircraft missiles to the rebels, to the opposition in Syria. Um, but I think they've been spinning this out. They've been talking about it, but not doing it, and then promising, promising and then moving forward, then saying, well, we'll wait to see and what comes out of the Geneva process. And meanwhile, events on the ground process. are overtaking them and may, in the end, force the West, as it were, to intervene militarily. And we could have a situation where, if I, do, I wonder what your view is, there is an all-out war in Syria. Well, there is, I mean, I think, for, sadly, tragically, there is a lot of scope for even greater levels of violence and, and human misery in Syria yet. Despite everything we've seen, it can get a lot worse. Um, the, uh, the, the, the friends of Syria, I think, are unwilling to intervene militarily directly in the conflict, which means that at best they can help the opposition uh, fight the government forces to a draw. I don't see anything further than that, just as I don't think that the, the government or the regime can actually win militarily. And so really what we should be asking ourselves is, how long will it take to reach a negotiated solution? Because eventually that is what will happen. And the question is, though, that at that point, even if Syria moves into some sort of peaceful situation, the immense amount of physical damage to infrastructure, to the economy, the flight of capital and of businessmen, the issues of repatriating refugees and displaced persons to homes that no longer exist, to communities that are now divided along sectarian lines, the scale of the problems is immense. And the response of the Friends of Syria and the international community so far has been so inadequate already that I very much doubt that they're going to provide what is needed and what is going to be needed even once peace has been established in Syria. We only have time for a couple of uh, brief answers from our remaining panelists. I want to put it to you that in the end, it seems that who's benefited from all this is actually the Assad government. First of all, to you in London, Haitham Sabahi. Yeah, well, well uh, the government is fighting for its existence, is fighting for its people, is fighting for its land, and is going to fight forever. If the fight imposed on it, is going to fight forever. If there is a political solution, uh, well, we all, as a Syrians, we welcome political solution. We want to see our brothers, all the Syrians, sit together and solve this uh, amic amicably and in, in a human way. But uh, fighting, and the, the Free Syrian Army keep calling it fighting, we're going to get to the palace, we we're going to do this, we're going to get rid of the regime, we're going to kill Dr. Bashar Assad. They are not going to get anywhere. They are on a losing battle. They are on the back foot at the moment, and this is where they're going to stay. And the Syrian Arab army will advance because they believe in the people and they believe in we the land. We only have a minute. And they believe in the country. Luaya and there is a signal coming you, out from it, Mr. Kerry do you there. Accept, do you accept Professor Sayeg's um, proposition that you know, a negotiated solution, political solution, is what's going to happen in the end? Let's get on with it. Actually, we are not fighting just for fight. For sure, we want a solution. But we want a solution th that the revolution from the start, all the people in Syria, they are asking for their freedom, for their democratic country, and Bashar al-Assad is he's killing them. We will bring justice. We never said that we will kill this person or this person. We want justice for our people. We want freedom for our we people. We want our democratic country. We want our democratic Syria, who depend on individual people, rights, and who, 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 who can ki save all the Syrian and the Syrian soil and the Syrian people living together in a liberal and equal uh, country. Thanks to our guests in Washington, D.C., Luai al-Mukdad, in Beirut, Yezid Sayeg, and in London, Haitham Subahi. 
and thank you for joining us. Remember, Al Jazeera has extensive and continuing coverage of what's happening in Syria, not just on this program, but with our hourly news programs and, of course, online at aljazeera.com. I'm Veronica Pedroza. Thank you for watching Inside Syria. Goodbye for now.